last episode. We were, but first let me just tell you that the information I'm giving you can get at www.pre-trib.org. You can download, I think it's a 18,000 word article that I wrote called Lovers of Zion, A History of Christian Zionism. And I think it's one of the most complete histories of Christian Zionism out there. Uh, follow, some will deal with 100 years or, you know, 200 years, but this deals with the whole 400 or so years of Christian Zionism. You can download as a PDF if you want this information. Also, uh, we're leading a trip to Israel, Jordan, and Petra, uh, December 30th, the end of this year, and January through January 9th, 2011. And you can download a PDF brochure at www.pretrib.org or talk to Janice or me for more information. Just wanted to throw that out there. So, it, so as we left, we were dealing with Lord Shaftesbury, who was a tremendous evangelical believer that had a, through, through the middle 1800s, had a tremendous impact on British Christianity, and he was a dyed-in-the-wool um, Christian Zionist, and he worked with Lord Palmerson. Lord Palmerson married uh, a relative of Lord Shaftesbury, and so they were uh, related in that way. And Lord Palmerston was the foreign secretary, and uh, he be eventually became the prime minister at one point of, it, of Great Britain, and using political, financial, and economic arguments uh, to convince him to help the Jews return to Palestine, and Palmerston did so. Uh, what was originally the religious beliefs of Christian Zionists became official British policy for political interest in Palestine and the Middle East. That's why, in the 1840s, that's why Barbara Tuckman's book is entitled The Bible and the Sword, because British restorationism believed partly for biblical reasons and partly for political reasons in the restoration of the Jews. Now, what is sad, after the Balfour Declaration is issued, you had totally different governments that got in and tried to undermine and destroy the restoration of Israel. So the British become bad people. Everybody say bad, bad, <laughs> after that. But up at this point in the 1800s, they are p trying to help Israel for both political and religious reasons, become a nation again. So this was primarily a result of Lord Shaftesbury's efforts. However, at the end of the day, Shaftesbury's plan failed, but it succeeded in setting a precedent for putting concrete political legs on one's religious beliefs. This w would eventually yield results in a later time. So Lord Shaftesbury had used his great power of persuasion to sway Henry John Temple Palmerston, to whom he was related by marriage, to the Restoration's position. Palmerston had a distinguished political career serving in the government almost uh, the entire time from 1807 till his death in 1865. And he served the British government many years as War Secretary, Foreign Minister, and a popular Prime Minister for about 10 years. And Shaftesbury was not the only one lobbying Palmerston in this time. A wave of premillennialism had hit the Scottish the Scots. And if they get fired up, they don't do anything halfway, do they? Uh, resulting in a growing sentiment toward Jewish restoration. In 1839, the Church of Scotland sent Andrew Bonar and Robert Murray McShane to report on the condition of the Jews in their land. Robert Murray McShane is a very famous Scottish preacher who died at age 29. And, but he lived an amazing life up to that time for the Lord. And, of course, Andrew Bonar, uh, along with his brother, uh, were very famous Scottish theologians. And uh, their report was widely publicized in Great Britain, and it was followed by a memorandum to Protestant monarchs of Europe for the restoration of the Jews to Palestine. This memorandum was printed verbatim in the London Times, including an advertisement by Shaftesbury igniting an enthusiastic campaign by the, the Times of London for restoration of the Jews. 320 citizens of Carlow Island sent a similar memorandum to Palmerston. And uh, 
when uh, I, f I forgot his name. <laughs> when um, when Andrew Bonar got back from his trip, he vowed that every sermon he preached in a church for the rest of his life would be about Israel, and he kept that promise. He also started a publication, a prophecy publication, and he was a very strong premillennialist. And uh, uh, George Grawler was a one-time governor of Australia, and uh, he was one of the most zealous and influential restorationists next to Shaftesbury in the 1840s. And Colonel Gawler was a senior commander at the Battle of Waterloo. And when he returned to England in 1841, he became a strong advocate of Jewish settlements in the land of Palestine. Uh, Grawler's restorationism, like most of his day, was sparked by his religious convictions, but he argued for Jewish return to the land upon geopolitical grounds as well. And he stated the following, quote, England urgently needs the shortest and safest line of communication. Egypt and Syria stand in intimate connection. A foreign hostile power uh, mighty in either would soon endanger British trade. In other words, they were trying to protect their crown jewel, India, uh, for, and safe passage through a Suez Canal and all of that is what he's talking about. And it is now for England to set her hand to the renovation of Syria through the only people uh, whose energies uh, will be extensively and permanently in the work, the real children of the soil, the sons of Israel. Now, Syria, Israel in the, in the Ottoman Empire was known as southern Syria at this time. So when he mentions Syria, he's referring to the land of Israel as well. So working with Sir Moses Montefiou, uh, the first British Jew who ever made it into politics in England, uh, Grawler uh, provided an agricultural strategy for Jewish resettlement of the Holy Land. And one of these Montefiore Gawler projects resulted in the planting of an orange grove near Jaffa, still existent today and known as Tel Aviv's Montefiore Quarter. In other words, the Jaffa oranges are famous, and this was uh, when they first got planted there and became famous. If you've ever lived in Britain or places, it's normal to eat Jaffa oranges, oranges from, there, from Israel there. Charles Henry Churchill, uh, an ancestor of Winston Churchill, was a British military officer stationed in Damascus in 1840. He was a Christian Zionist, and he supported the Jews against the non-Zionist Christians of Damascus. See, those would be the uh, Syriac Christians who are the, or the Maronite Christians who are of Greek Orthodox extraction. And so he was a Christian Zionist and supported the Jews against the non-Zionist Christians of Damascus. It was through his efforts that he helped acquaint the Jews accused of the infamous charge of blood libel. In other words, he went to, uh, took it to court. They were accused of blood libel by these Gentile Christians, and uh, he defended them in court and won the day. And uh, they threw a big celebration for him and all of this, uh, all the Jews did in, in Jerusalem. And this was what... Uh, Shaftesbury had hoped would happen that they would be able to help protect the Jews in Israel who had no protection in the Ottoman Empire. Colonel Churchill was honored at a banquet hosted by a grateful Jewish community when he spoke of the hour of liberation of Israel that was approaching when the Jewish nation would once again take its place among the powers of the world. In a letter to Jewish philanthropist Sir Moses Montefiou, dated June 14, 1841, Churchill said, uh, I'm sorry, I cut that out, but nevertheless, British General Charles Warren, who was a great archaeologist who studied a lot of stuff uh, in Israel, did archaeological excavations uh, in Jerusalem, served in Syria on behalf of the Palestine Explor Exploration Fund. In 1875, he wrote the Land of Promise, or Turkey's Guarantee. So Warren proposed that the land be developed with the avowed uh, intention of gradually introducing the Jews, pure and simple, who would eventually occupy and govern the country. He even speculated the land could hold a population of 15 million. So this is in 1875 when it was a desert place. This is about the same time that uh, 
Mark Twain had gone over there and said he traveled two whole days without even seeing one person. And it was a very empty place at that time. Uh, so you have all of these proposals coming from the West of people wanting to see the Jews come back in because the economies of these Arab co countries before they discovered oil were like zero or below. I mean, they had virtually no prosperity except by the absentee landowners who often owned this. And the average person over there was very, I mean, dirt, dirt poor at these times. And so they thought, uh, you know, for example, this is why Lebanon has some degree of prosperity because it, it was populated by Christians, Arab Christians, which wasn't under Sharia law, which oppresses economic development, in case you didn't know that. And only where they have had oil uh, have they been able to have prosperity in Muslim, especially Arab Muslim nations in the Middle East. So uh, Lawrence Oliphant is another a restorationist, and he was an evangelical British Protestant, an officer in the British Foreign Service, a writer, a, a world traveler, and an unofficial diplomat. Oliphant was passionate about the Jewish restoration to their land that came from his intense religious convictions, which he tried to conceal them behind arguments based on strategy and politics. And uh, there were many other British restorationists during the 19th century that created a momentum that would pay off later in British control of Palestine and the Balfour Declaration. In other words, this was a, a high time of aristocratic British Christianity was very strong from about 1820 to 1880. And it provided the impetus for the Balfour Declaration and, but that was kind of the last gasp in 1917 of British Christianity. And then after they got the Balfour Declaration in, then, then uh, Britain pretty much undermined and cut off uh, its support of Israel. Restorationism found a voice in one of the most popular novelists of the 19th century, George Eliot, penned the influential restorationist novel Daniel Deranda. And novels have a tremendous influence. By the way, George Eliot was a she. And uh, she you know, took the name George because she didn't think she would be accepted if she put her real name on there. But she supported Christian Zionism with a famous novel that many Israel, uh, Brit British people read. So you had Lord Lindsay, Lord Shaftesbury, Lord Palmerston, Disraeli, another Jewish politician who became prime minister, Lord Manchester, Holman Hunt, who painted the famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. Uh, Sir Charles Warren and Hall Caine and others were a British Christian restorationist. And among the 19th century British, one observes the gradual drift from purely religious notion to the political. These two influences, the Bible and the sword, religion and politics, as Barbara Tuckman has put it, would merge into a powerful team that led to the Balfour Declaration and the eventual founding of the Jewish state in the 20th century. And as we see, European restorationism uh, also was on the rise, and it led the way when it came to Christian Zionism. Uh, there were important contributions from uh, continental Europe. While Napoleon's attempt at Jewish restoration lacked religious motivation, there were many Europeans who were smitten with religious restorationism. Now, Napoleon tried to use the Jewish restoration of the land to help overthrow uh, the established powers that he, his army was trying to do. He said he was trying to get the uh, Egyptians to help him and various other things, and he tried to bait the Jews to come back by promising them a homeland, you know, for political reasons. The Enlightenment in the 18th century France and Germany, by its very nature of questioning the past, questioned the Jews' status as separated from the rest of society because of religious differences. There's all throughout uh, so-called Christian Europe in the Middle Ages, Jews had to live by themselves, in what, and that's where the word ghetto came from, in case you didn't know. It was the Jews who had to live by themselves, separate from the other people uh, that the word ghetto developed. Such a development made the public free expressions of ideas more common. As a result of the new openness, some began advocating the return of the Jews to their homeland. The rise of nationalism was another trend of the day. Uh, in other words, the breaking up of Christendom and, 
is Islamic empire into nation states uh, was a movement that helped, uh, had an unusual effect on the restorationist movement. It increased Christian support and decreased Jewish support because many Jews were under this new freedom, were finding prosperity in European places, and they didn't want to go to that desolate place like Israel. You see what I'm saying? And so many of the Jews did not support restorationism. Now, the Jews in Eastern Europe, like Fiddler on the Roof situations, they were supportive, and it was mainly the Eastern European Jews who were being persecuted in the late 1800s that were, were supportive of a homeland in Israel. Now, a German Lutheran, uh, Zimpel, who described himself as a doctor of philosophy, a member of the Grand Duchal Saxon Society for the Mineralogy and uh, Genealogy at Jena, published pamphlets in the mid-1800s entitled Israelites in Jerusalem and Appeal to All Christendom, as well as to the Jews for the Liberation of Jerusalem. He addressed a number of geographical issues and warned that if the Jews were not allowed to return to Palestine, then it would lead to their persecution and slaughter. Unfortunately, Zimpel proved correct in his predictions in the mid-1800s. And Frenchman Charles uh, Joseph Prince de Le Legine advocated Jewish restorationism. He called upon the Christians of Europe to lobby the Turkish Sultan so that the Jews could return to their homeland. He appealed, his appeal was used by Napoleon in his efforts to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And among those French restorations were theologians and authors, but also increasingly politicians. Some of them included Ernest Langhorne, uh, Alexandra Dumas, Jean Henry Dunet, and who was also the founder of the International Red Cross. He was a Swiss French guy. In other words, he spoke French in uh, Switzerland. Switzerland has always been, relatively speaking, the most pro Israel country and still is today in Europe. And restoration proposals were put forth by a number of Europeans in the 19th century. A Swiss theologian named Samuel uh, Goussin wrote a book advocating a Jewish return to the land in 1844. Uh, Italian Benito Mussolini wrote a book, uh, Mussolino, wrote a book after a visit to the Holy Land in which he argued that the restoration of the Jews would allow European culture into the Middle East. In other words, they would get a foothold uh, of, of Western development. And see, that was a big issue at this time. The Turks, Turkish or Ottoman culture was rotting because it couldn't compete with the uh, developments of science and technology in the Christian West. And for 100 years, that created a big dilemma in Turkey, you know, the Ottoman Empire, and everyone knew for 100 years that the Turkish Empire was going to go under eventually because it could not compete uh, militarily and technologically with the West. And so you had half of the Turks that wanted to uh, go toward the Western uh, of, of modernization, which Turkoman, who founded the modern state of Turkey, eventually won out. And then you had the uh, Islamicists who didn't want to do that. And now we're seeing, after all these years, almost 100 years, the reversal of Turkey going back to Islam, to the Islamists uh, who, are, who are taking control. Even though the momentum of over 300 years of British restoration was beginning to fade, there was enough activity to carry through World War I, which saw England finally gain control of the Holy Land. The early 1900s saw some of the most devout Christian Zionists arise and give birth to the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate for Palestine. The Balfour Declaration was issued in 1917, and then the League of Nations in 1921 gave what is called the British Mandate that legally, according to the League of Nations, which is a forerunner to the United Nations, gave Britain the right to oversee or manage Palestine in 1921. So here you have Lord Balfour, Arthur Balfour, a Scottish guy, uh, was born in Scotland and reared in a strong Christian home. Now, he wasn't much of a Christian himself, but nevertheless, he was influenced by Christianity 
in a tremendous way, which instilled into him a love for the Jews based upon a biblical interest. Balfour, a lifelong bachelor, even wrote a book on Christian philosophy and theology. Lord Balfour served much of his life within the highest offices of British government, including prime minister. His interest in Jewish restoration was biblical rather than imperial. His sister and biographer said the following, Balfour's interest in the Jews and their history was lifelong. It originated in the Old Testament training of his mother and in his Scottish upbringing. I once uh, was supposed to deliver a paper over in uh, Ireland and I had an injury to my leg and I couldn't do it. So I, a Scottish guy read my paper and it sounded so good with him reading it rather than me. But nevertheless, as he grew up, his intellectual admira admiration and sympathy for certain aspects of Jewish philosophy and culture grew also, and the problem of the Jews in the modern world seemed to him of immense importance. He always talked eagerly on this, and I remember, this is his sister talking, in childhood imbibing from him the idea that Christian religion civilization owes to Judaism an immeasurable debt shamefully ill pay, repaid. Many Christians at this time thought that the Jews had suffered so much under Christendom that the Christians owed them their nation back. That was the logic. That's what Harry Truman and others believed, that Christendom, uh, since the Jews had been persecuted by Christendom throughout the Middle Ages, and then along comes Hitler and wipes all of that memory out, you see, because he was not, he was a secular guy. I know they say he was a Christian, but that kind of takes the focus off of the persecution and all these so-called Christian nations that the Jews were receiving. And that was the, a lot of the logic for restorationism at that time. In 1906, a time in which he had just lost the office of prime minister in England, Lord Balfour met Chaim Weizmann. Now, um, who's... Herzl, Theodore Herzl is the founder in 1896 of, of Zion, Jewish Zionism, and he died at a very young age, and Chaim Weizmann took over the Zionist movement. And he was a chemistry professor at the University of Manchester, and he was the foremost proponent of early Zionism next to Herzl. Balfour's sister said, quote, Balfour for his part told me often about the impression the conversation made on him. So Kai uh, Wiseman went in and famously had a, a conversation with Balfour and uh, it really influenced him. Balfour's sister said that uh, Balfour for his part told me often about the impression the conversation made on him. It was from the talk with Wiseman that I saw that the Jewish form of patriotism was unique, noted Lord Balfour. Their love for their country refused to be satisfied by the Uganda scheme. You know, they had promised them, why don't you go to Uganda instead of Israel? And of course, that was turned down immediately by the, the early Zionist movement. And it was Wiseman's absolute refusal even to look at uh, which impressed me. In other words, he wasn't for it either because he knew the Bible. After many starts and stops, Balfour was finally able to persuade all the British war cabinet that the time had come to issue a declaration of British support for Jewish restoration of their homeland. And when England, who normally has a parliament, is at war, they cannot go before parliament for every issue that they need to handle uh, to handle a war. So they create what's called a war cabinet, usually made up of 12 people foreign uh, secretaries and parliament members. And nine of the 12 people in the war cabinet in World War I were Christian Zionists. And it is believed, uh, the consensus of scholarship is that they would have never gotten the Balfour Declaration through the entire parliament. But because of the war parliament, they did get it through. November 2nd, 1917, and was addressed to Lord Rothschild. And here it is. This is a photocopy of the letter that uh, Balfour, who was foreign secretary under Lord George, sent to Rothschild, who was head of the Israel Fund. Yes, the famous conspiracy banker guy that some of y'all have heard of. And it says, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. 
and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political structure enjoyed by the Jews in any other country. That's the Balfour Declaration. Now, Israel, how many of y'all know they don't have a constitution? They have a Declaration of Independence, and the Balfour Declaration is incorporated in their Declaration of Independence, which you can see at the Israeli Knesset. Uh, it's written in Hebrew. Before the Balfour Declaration was finally issued, much discussion with allies and behind-the-scene negotiations took place. Uh, Prime Minister Lloyd George wanted to make sure the United States was fully on board before it issued it. In fact, they wouldn't have done it if the U.S. wasn't on board with them. President Woodrow Wilson would support it and on October 1918 uh, issued the following statement of acceptance. He said, uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't include it. The impact of the Balfour Declaration was a tremendous event within the Zionist movement. Since Britain was on the verge of controlling Palestine, it provided a great step on the road to the founding of the nation of Israel in 1948. This great declaration was spearheaded not just by British geopolitical concerns, as important as that was within their thinking, but by Christian sympathies that were formed by biblical beliefs. Now, what is interesting here is Lloyd George, who was a very strong Christian Zionist, he grew up in Wales, and he wasn't much of a Christian either, but his mother had the same impact that Balfour had on him by teaching him the Bible. And he secretly sent 50,000 troops from the Western Front in Europe to the Palestine campaign and sent his best general, Allenby, to head it up to make sure that they defeated uh, the Ottoman Turks and took over Palestine because he believed in, in Christian Zionism. And then, of course, when Allenby did defeat them, the famous incident where he refused to ride his horse into Jerusalem, Allenby, General Allenby was a Bible-believing Anglican, and he said the next person that's going to ride their horse into Jerusalem is going to be Jesus, and he walked in with his officer corps into Jerusalem. And you can get video of that off the internet if you'd like to see it. Lord Balfour does not appear to have been moved by his views of eschatology, although it may have been a factor, but simply exiles who should be given back in payment of Christianity's measurable debt, their homeland, as I mentioned earlier. And here is Prime Minister Lloyd George. Uh, I, I noticed that when I was in London once, they've got a statue of him across from Westminster in a park. He's a real sharp guy from Wales, and he was the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, when the Balfour Declaration was in issued. Uh, Balfour and Lord George were both lifelong friends. From Wales, Lord George was steeped in the Bible in which he was trained as a youth, and this clearly predisposed him to view with favor the Zionist movement. Uh, it was Lord George's decision that was primarily responsible for the British uh, launching a large-scale offense, as I've already told you, to conquer Palestine. Uh, he was determined to gain control without the French uh, inter to interfere. He was worried that the French wouldn't be disposed toward implementing a Jewish state uh, like the British were. And also he wanted the Suez Canal, but that's a whole other thing. He, uh, and he also wanted his country to carry out what he regarded as God's work in Palestine. Uh, he made a number of statements concerning his biblical upbringing, which influenced him throughout his life. And he recalled how in the first meeting with Chaim Weizmann in December 1914, place names kept coming into the conversation that were, quote, more familiar to me than those of the Western Front, unquote. Lord Balfour's biographer said that his interest in Zionism stemmed from his boyhood training in the Old Testament under the guidance of his mother. And we're, we're seeing this throughout, that the, the biblical upbringing, even when these people were not Bible-believing Christians later, influenced them and disposed them toward a favorable uh, view of Israel. And uh, when speaking about the Balfour Declaration, Lord George said it was undoubtedly inspired by natural sympathy and admiration and also by the fact that, as you must remember, we have been trained even more in Hebrew history than in the history of our own country. I could tell you all the kings of Israel, but I doubt whether I could even name a half dozen of the kings of England. 
unquote. That's not a very good statement for a British prime minister to make, but nevertheless, uh, that was the truth. So undoubtedly, God put men like Lord Balfour and Lord George into power a position at this crucial time in history to aid the eventual founding of the modern Jewish state. Barbara Tuckman tells us the following, Lord George's afterthoughts on the motivation of the War Cabinet in issuing the Balfour Declaration have bewitched and bewildered all subsequent accounts of this episode. Unquestionably, he doctored the picture. Why he did so is a matter of opinion. My own feeling is that he knew that his own motivation as well as Balfour's was in large part a sentiment that is a biblical one, but he could not admit it. So he tells them that he gave it to them as a favor for Chaim Wiseman uh, inventing smokeless, uh, not smokeless tobacco, but smokeless uh, gunpowder. Now, here's an interesting fellow, William Hetchler. I mean, this guy is an amazing fellow. The modern Jewish founder of Zionism is recognized to have been Theodore Herzl. His earliest and closest advisor just happened to have been the Christian minister William Hetchler, who was a zealous Christian Zionist. Reverend Hetchler was a pastor who was born in India of German missionary parents. I mean, this guy has every kind of ethnic strand and influence in his life that you could imagine. He attended college in Basel, Switzerland, which is where Herzl was living when he first met him. I call that Calvinist luck if you know what I mean. And Hetzler was bilingual in English and German from childhood and was like his father, a member of the Church of England. And so he studied theology in London and then in Tübingen, which is in Germany, which was the center of the liberal approach to the scripture. However, he was not persuaded by the key arguments of the liberals and retained a distinctively creedal, doctrinal, even literalist theology. Uh, this makes sense since anyone holding to a liberal view of Scripture would not have come to love Israel as Hetzler did. Upon recommendation of the British court, he became the private tutor to Prince Ludwig, a son of Frederick the Grand Duke of Baden. At the time, he met the Grand Duke's nephew, the future Emperor William II of Germany. And I remember later when William visited the King of England, he got in a big discussion about Bible prophecy with the King of England, King George, who didn't like this guy because he was talking about the Bible all the time. After the prince's premature death, Hetzler served in the ministry in England. At Hetzler's behest, the Grand Duke built up a massive library of biblical eschatology, Bible history, and archaeology. So he, he's the tutor in the royal family in Germany, and he gets them the largest prophecy library in the world at the time. At the Grand Duke's request, Hetzler presented sermons and scholarly papers on these themes before the court and its visitors. I'm sure they enjoyed listening to that. Hetzler was one of the most zealous Christian Zionists of all time, and he seemed consumed with the goal of Jewish restorationism to their homeland. In 1882, he published a book entitled The Restoration of the Jews to Palestine According to Prophecy. In 1885, Hetzler was appointed chaplain to the British Embassy in Vienna which just so happened to be where Herzl was at the time as well. In 1996, Hetzler introduces himself to Herzl and thus becomes his more, most important aid, advisor, and advocate. And he introduced himself by knocking on his door. He didn't even say hello. He said, are you Theodore Herzl? Yes. And he threw a map of Israel down on his floor and gets in and starts showing him, you know, one of these kind of guys who's so into it, he starts showing him and telling him about how they're going to uh, recreate the nation of Israel. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm uh, William Hetchler, you know. And it is said that William Hetchler would prove to be not only the, the first, but the most constant and the most uh, indefatigable of Herzl's followers. He got appointments with all of these German and British uh, big time guys and gave Herzl entree to them because he knew him, of course. Hetzler's connection in both Germany and England provided help, proved uh, helpful to Herzl as Hetzler often arranged meetings for Herzl with the highest officials of each nation. Hetzler often told the secular Herzl uh, that what they were doing was fulfilling prophecy. And Herzl grew to trust Hetzler more and more, indeed frequently for brief but crucial periods. He virtually entrusted the whole Zionist enterprise to Hetzler and through Hetzler frequently annoyed, though Hetzler frequently annoyed and embarrassed him. He never failed him. 
this guy was such a zeal. This is the great Theodore Herzl, the father of the Zionist movement, a, a Jewish man who was never uh, became a believer in Jesus. But Herzl said in his diary of Hetzler, of all the people who have been drawn to me by the movement, the Reverend Hetzler is the finest and most fanciful. He frequently writes me postcards for no particular reason, telling me that he hasn't been able to sleep the previous night because Jerusalem came to his mind. Now, if he were alive today, he'd be sending him emails constantly, you know, and giving, calling him on the phone. But this is the kind of guy Hetzler was. And, you know, I couldn't sleep last night. I was thinking about Jerusalem. <laughs> and so... Hetzler was a true friend and supporter of Herzl, who was at his side when he died in 1904. Later, Hetzler wrote, I was with him at the beginning of his dreams, and I was with him almost at the last moment of his, er of his earthly death. Christian Zionist William Hetzler continued to work hard for the cause that almost solely possessed his mind by trying to convince Gentile Christians of the worthiness of this cause. He died in 1931. And now we switch to America, and here's William Blackstone who is recognized by Bibi Netanyahu in his book and others as the father of Zionism, a Gentile Christian from Chicago. Chicago has had some good people come out of there. <laughs> One of the most outstanding examples of Christian Zionists is that of American William E. Blackstone, who was born in Adams, New York, and reared in a pious Methodist home, where he became a Christian at age 11. When he married, he moved to Chicago, became a very successful businessman, and even though he was a Methodist, uh, he had become motivated by his dispensational view of the Bible. Methodists were not into prophecy. They were into sanctification. And very few early Methodists were into Bible prophecy. So that's why I bring that out, to work for the reestablishment of national Israel. So Blackstone, in essence, becomes uh, uh, Lord... Uh, Shaftesbury of America. He's basically the Lord Shaftesbury of America. And he's a tireless, self-taught student of Bible and theology. He became very interested in what the Bible had to say about Israel. Like many Christians with similar instances, this led to attempts to evangelize Jewish people with the gospel. He started the first Christian Jewish outreach in, in America in Chicago. In fact, one time, uh, he became so respected by the Jews, a whole group, he had 5,000 Orthodox Jews that heard him, and he not only preached the gospel, but he gave an altar call to, to Orthodox Jews. Uh, and he found in 1887, the Chicago, founded in 1887, the Chicago Hebrew Mission for the Evangelization of the Jews. And then he wrote the best-selling book, Jesus is Coming, in 1908. Sold a million copies. Actually, he wrote it in the late 1800s, and its final edition was 1908. So he beat Hal Lindsey, you know, to being a big-time selling author, which sold over a million copies in three editions. Probably no dispensational Bible teacher of his time had a larger popular audience. And concerning the restoration of Israel... Sometimes you hit it when you shouldn't. Okay, no? Okay, concerning the restoration of the Jews of their homeland, Blackstone said in his book, but, but perhaps you say, I don't believe the Israelites are to be restored to Cana and Jerusalem re rebuilt. Dear reader, have you read the declarations of God's word about it? Surely nothing is more plainly stated in the Scripture. See, this is the third or fourth time we've seen this, you know, starting in the 1500s. And uh, he then proceeds to list almost 14 pages of virtually nothing but Scripture citations supporting his belief. Then he concludes, we might fill a book with comments upon how Israel shall be restored, but all we have desired to do was to show that it is an inconvertible uh, fact of prophecy and that this is intimately connected with our Lord's appearing and that we trust we will have the uh, satisfactorily accomplished. 
1891, Blackstone, the activist, had obtained the signatures of 413 prominent Americans and sent his document to President Benjamin Harrison advocating the resettlement of prospective Jews in Russia to a new homeland. See, this is when Fiddler on the Roof was taking place and Russian pogroms were taking place in Eastern Europe. Uh, in what was then called Palestine. Part of the petition, uh, but among the 413 signers listed by their cities, uh, Chicago, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, were the opinion makers of the day, the editors or publishers of the leading newspapers and religious periodicals, at least 93 newspapers in all, the mayors of Chicago, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and, and Baltimore as well as other officials, leading churchmen and rabbis, outstanding businessmen in Washington, Speaker of the House of Representatives T.B. Reed, Chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs Robert R. Hitt, and William McKinley of Ohio, who later became president. Even though it accomplished little politically, Blackstone's petition was said to have had a galvanizing impact upon Americans as a whole. The petition received widespread coverage in newspapers and generated a great amount of discussion and acceptance that sparked great interest among the Jews as a whole. Blackstone later made a similar appeal to President Woodrow Wilson, a Presbyterian minister's son who had become a Christian Zionist. Uh, of course, Wilson was a liberal politically and everything, but liberals at this time tended to be Christian Zionists for human rights reasons which influenced his acceptance of the Balfour Declaration in 1970. So he's saying that Blackstone helped influence Wilson to accept the Balfour Declaration, which was a specific a step in the refounding of the nation of Israel. It is not surprising that there is today a forest in Israel named the Blackstone Forest in his honor. And he, uh, so neither shall it be surprising to learn that William Blackstone was once dubbed the father of Zionism for his political activities on behalf of the Jews like Hetzler, Blackstone spent the rest of his life working for his beloved cause until his death in 1935. While he was thrilled with the developments of the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate, 1921 after World War I, he basically died disappointed that Israel had not yet become a nation. However, that would indeed take place 13 years later. And here's the role of who I call the cussing Baptist, Harry S. Truman. President Harry Truman grew up in Missouri in a devout Christian home. I guess, you know, he must not have learned that in his home, but I think he learned it during World War I when he was off with the boys. Uh, when Harry was born, his parents were attending a Southern Baptist church which uh, both sets of grandparents had helped establish in Grandview, Missouri. His father, John Anderson Truman, was also a strong Baptist. Both his father and mother, Martha, raised him in the conventional Baptist tradition. While growing up, Truman read the Bible through twice by age 12 and two more times by age 14. He was an avid reader. And from Sunday school and his own readings of the Bible, he knew many biblical passages by heart and could quote many Bible verses at random. So young Harry was an avid reader and remained so throughout his entire life. The Truman family owned a set of great men and famous women edited by Charles Francis Horn. According to Truman's daughter, Margaret, the book Truman preferred most after Horn's biographies was the Bible. And there is even indication that Truman considered entering the ministry for a time. Just think if he'd gone in the ministry, it would have been a real waste. Uh, every indication reveals that Harry and his sister Margaret were very active in the church throughout their uh, late teens and early 20s. And, and see, uh, you know, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, had four different vice presidents for his four terms. And he had only met Harry Truman twice, who was his fourth vice president when FDR died 30 days into his fourth term and Harry Truman became president. Now, I wonder why the Lord brought Harry Truman in as president. Another one of those uh, Calvinist luck situations. What about Truman's Christian beliefs? Truman had little interest in theological issues, although he had almost a fundamentalist reference for the Bible. Blending Truman's great interest in history and the Bible, he once stated 
the following about the United States. Quote, divine providence has played a great role in our history. I have the feeling that God has created us and brought us to our present position of power and strength for some great purpose. It is not given to us to know fully what that purpose is, but I think we may be sure of one thing, and that is that our country is intended to do all it can in cooperating with other nations to help create peace and preserve peace in the world. It is given to defend the spiritual values, the moral code, against the vast forces of evil that seek to destroy them. I wish we had a president that would say that. I'd vote for him in a minute. And that, that's his basic belief about America. Truman's Christian Zionism was a combination of his attraction to the people of the Bible, the Jews, that grew out of his familiarity with biblical details with humanitarian concern for a persecuted people. Harry Truman was head in the Senate of a pro-Zionist group of senators, and he tried to get FDR uh, to accept the, the ship, the Exodus, into the United States in 1945, and he led the Senate to pass a resolution that FDR ignored and let those poor people go back to Germany and, and they all died in the Holocaust. You know, he was trying to get FDR to let them off. So he had a, he had a track record in this. He, he wasn't a Johnny-come-lately guy. The stories of the Bible, said Truman, were to me stories about real people, and I felt I knew some of them better than actual people that I knew. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> His Christian Zionist beliefs were well-developed and deeply rooted long before he became president of the United States. Presidential counsel Clark Clifford, who only died a few years ago, tells us that Truman's, quote, own reading of, an, of ancient history and the Bible made him a supporter of the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, even when others who were sympathetic to the plight of the Jews were talking of sending them to places like Brazil. He did not need to be convinced by Zionists. You know, Truman said, I didn't need to be lobbied by anybody. All in all, he believed that the surviving Jews deserved some place that was historically their own. I remember him talking once about the problem of repatriating displaced persons. Everyone else who's been dragged away from his country has some place to go back to, he said, but the Jews have no place to go. Truman's Christian Zionism came into play during two of the greatest decisions that he would have to make uh, during his presidency. First, how should the U.S. vote in the partition of Israel, which would result in the creation of the new Jewish state during the United Nations vote in late November of 1947? Back then, remember, the U.N. was, was uh, in San Francisco. Second, should the U.S. diplomacy recognize the newly formed nation when David Ben-Gurion declared the birth of Israel in May 14, 1948. Here he is, David and Gurion, reading the establishment of the nation of Israel with Herzl's picture there in the middle of the room there in Tel Aviv on May 14, 1948. And on both issues, virtually all of Truman's personal advisors, the State Department, the military established, were opposed to him. Truman's most trusted foreign policy advisors, almost to a man, were dead set against the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. The president faced the formidable f uh, front of George Marshall, who, th who was the Secretary of State, who threatened to resign. Uh, Under Secretary of State Robert Lovett, Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal, policy planning staff George Keenan, State Department counsel Charles Bolin, and Marshall's successor as Secretary Dean Atchison. And, uh, in fact, I have two PhDs, one from the Hoover Institute in Stanford, that analyze FDR, and they all say strongly FDR would have never recognized Israel. And as I say, this is probably why we got his last vice president as president, because God had other plans. Loy Henderson, director of the NEA, who arrived at the State Department just three days after FDR's death, also opposed the Zionist names. William Yale, also at the State Department, said that the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine would be a major blunder in statesmanship. When Secretary Forrestal reminded the president of the critical need for Saudi Arabian oil in the event of war, Truman said that he would handle the situation in the light of justice, not oil. Truman dealt with both issues by applying his the buck starts here approach with tough, responsible decisions. And Truman instructed the American delegate at the UN, Herschel Johnson, to announce the U.S.'s endorsements of UNESCO 
partition plan in October 11th, uh, 1947. Then 17 minutes after David Ben-Gurion's declaration of the new Israel state, a cable was sent to Israel and a message went to the press from the White House announcing the following. Here, here is his actual document, a photocopy of his actual document that was written out and then his handwriting uh, on it, which says that this government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the state of Israel. Notice they had the new Jewish state and he marked out and put the state of Israel in there. Signed Harry Truman approved May 14, 1948. And so if Truman had not done this, it's believed that Israel would have never made it because they needed the U.S. backing, which led uh, to others supporting them. Clark Clifford said of the President Truman's decision to favor Israel the following observation. As a student of the Bible, he believed in the historic justification for a Jewish homeland, and it was a conviction with him that the Balfour Declaration of 1917 constituted a solemn promise that fulfill the age-old hope and dream of the Jewish people. So after his presidency, a longtime Jewish friend, Eddie Jacobson, who he was in business with, introduced Truman to a group of professors by saying, this is the man who helped create the state of Israel, but Truman corrected him. What do you mean, I helped create? I'm Cyrus. I'm Cyrus. Cyrus was the guy in the sixth century who brought the Jews back to Israel from Persia. So he, he, this is what he thought of his decision, see, connected with the Bible there. Truman was comparing himself to Cyrus in the Old Testament to enable the Jews to return to the land in the 6th century BC from their 70 year captivity. So, the, and here I just talk about that this is probably the reason why Truman was put in and FDR was taken out as president and uh, to, to make this important decision. Now, here's an interesting thing, listen. Turning down Golda Meir's request for arms to defend her country is reported to have said, let the Israelis bleed a little. Golda Meir is desperate. I'm going to start it over. This is of State Henry Kissinger in turning down Golda Meir's request for arms to defend her country is reported to have said, let the Israelis bleed a little. Golda Meir is desperate. Without help, Israel will not survive many more days of the pounding assault from all sides, despite all the Kahalanis and those like him who are bravely defending their homeland and sacrificing their lives on all the front Very lines. Strong. And so she picks up the phone and calls the private line of U.S. President Richard Nixon. It is 3 o'clock in the morning. Television film producer and documentarian Bill McKay's investigation of the American role in the Yom Kippur War describes what happened when President Nixon took Golda Meir's call in the middle of the night. Mr. President, if you don't help us, the Jewish people will never survive. He said something interesting, if not strange. He said, you know, I could almost hear my mother's voice. She would tell me stories and read to me from the Old Testament, the heroes of the Bible. And one afternoon, she said, Richard, someday you're going to be in a position where you can help save the Jewish people. And when that day comes, you must do everything in your power. And he said at that moment, I realized, maybe for the first time in my presidency, why I had become president of the United States. It was the largest airlift of armaments since World War II. The president kept his word. Everything Golda asked for, she got. Every weapon, every vehicle, every piece of equipment, and all the ammunition to operate them. A virtual arsenal airlifted overnight to Israel's front lines. Many military experts credit that decision, that request, at that moment, as the essential element that saved Israel from destruction. In another striking parallel to David in the Bible, Richard Nixon turned aside the Goliath of indifference to Israel in his government, faced down a powerful Secretary of State who would turn against him, and accepted the threat to his own presidency to save Israel in its hour of need. Before it was over, the Yom Kippur War demonstrated one of the most incredible turnaround victories ever recorded in military history. 
So we see here that God has used Gentile Christians to bring about the restoration of the modern state of Israel, which is fulfilling prophecy, and to sustain that state. Even people like Richard Nixon, who is not viewed very highly in our country, but even he had biblical influence from his mother uh, that impacted his thinking when it came to Israel. And so God has used people to bring Israel back into place, and he is getting ready to, to now, through the tribulation, woo his people to himself. And, and reveal to them that he indeed is the Messiah, which will bring blessing to the whole world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are still in control of history, just like when you sent your people Israel into Babylon. You demonstrated that you were in control through Nebuchadnezzar and other situations on individual level. And even though this world is increasingly rebelling against you, you're still in control, and one day you will step in to judge the world and to rescue your people. And as believers who learn the Word of God, the Bible, I pray that we would be influenced to think your thoughts after you in this area and to not be influenced by the wrong-headed thinking of the world. And use us perhaps maybe not to accomplish some grand scheme in Israel, but to proclaim the good news to others as well as supporting to our friends and acquaintances your plan for Israel in the future. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.